All right, so greetings to everyone in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray that the Heavenly Father is going to make this information that we share in here uh, will, will be, uh, you know, knowledge and understanding that is going to greatly bless all who hear and who study the Word of God to show themselves approved unto Him. So today I was going to continue uh, my, uh, my teaching on... Uh, the book of revelation but i mean i'm a little bit pressed for time today so i just thought i'd maybe change the topic a little bit here and uh, basically i want to i received an email from rob i don't know if he's online or not but uh you know it's about the identity of the restrainer so-called restrainer in uh in uh, the book of uh second thessalonians in verse two ch verses uh, chapter two verses six and seven so this is the email that uh, rob had sent me he said hi paul I have heard your view that the restrainer of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, it's actually not verse 3, it's verse uh, 6 and 7, is Satan. I've held the view since the 90s that the restrainer is actually the angel Michael. See Daniel 12, verse 1. Let me know your thoughts, your friend Rob. So I just wanted to go through this. I have done a video on this already. But I want to go through this again, you know, as to who is this uh, so-called restrainer uh, of Second Thessalonians, and then uh, you know why why I believe it to be Satan. So Daniel chapter twelve, verse one reads, "And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which stands for the children of that people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, that people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book." So Rob did not elaborate why he thinks that Michael is the restrainer, for it is not possible to draw such a conclusion from a simple reading of Daniel 12.1. So later in the study, I will detail the role that Michael plays in the revealing of the man of sin for a very short period of time, which is followed soon thereafter by the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Although there is way more teaching by so-called prophecy teachers and YouTube channels about the coming of the Antichrist, then about the coming of Jesus Christ, we must keep in mind that the Bible places Jesus, who is God the creator in bodily form, as the power and the authority in all of creation. The Bible teaches that the main event that is eagerly waited for by all creation is the second coming of Jesus Christ, not the coming of the Antichrist. The Antichrist's role in the end times is actually very minor, taking only one chapter and maybe a few more verses out of the whole Bible. So he is not that great a power or that central a figure that God has to sweat trying to restrain him through the Holy Spirit or by using the Archangel Michael, who I'm sure have much more important things to do with their time. This fascination with the Antichrist is a major distraction created by Satan because it turns the attention of believers from Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior, to the Antichrist who will not even be seen by the majority of people alive today. So who is the restrainer? And why does he want to withhold the revealing of the man of sin in his appointed time? So let me read uh, from 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. And now you know what withholds that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. So Rob suggests that the restrainer is the Archangel Michael, while many others teach that it is the Holy Spirit. However, from a careful study of scripture, it becomes apparent that the restrainer can only be Satan and no one else. In the KJV, the word used is not the restrainer, but rather it uses the phrases, what withholdeth that he might be revealed in verse six, and he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way in verse 7. One of the meanings of the word let, that's an archaic English word. You know, let in this time means to allow, but this here has another meaning. Let is to restrain. So the use of the word restrainer, although it's not used in the KJV, is not entirely incorrect. So I made a video sometime back revealing of the identity who one who withholds as being Satan. I will post that video at the end of this introduction in which I'm adding some information as to why the one that lets, meaning the one that prevents the Antichrist from being revealed can only be Satan and no one else. 
Okay, so that video link will be in the description when I post this uh, later on YouTube. To begin with, the subject of the second chapter of Thessalonians, of two Thessalonians, of second Thessalonians, is the second coming of Jesus Christ to be revealed to all creation as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So the subject of Second Thessalonians 2 is not the son of perdition, otherwise known as the Antichrist, or his revelation to the world. No, the subject is Jesus Christ and his revelation to all of creation, not just to this world. We read in verse 1, okay? This is Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, that the day of Christ is at hand. This time of the gathering together of the elect in heaven and in earth is also taught in Matthew 24, verse 31, and in Revelation chapter 14, verse 14. So the apostle goes on to teach that what we are looking for is the day of Christ, okay, not the day of the Antichrist. But before this day comes, the son of perdition must be revealed. However, there is a person or power that withholds or stands in the way of the coming of the Antichrist. A power or a person that tries to prevent this event, and therefore this person must be removed or taken out of the way before the man of sin can be revealed. Paul taught the Thessalonians that unless the Antichrist first comes for a short period on the earth, our Lord Jesus Christ cannot come and set up his eternal kingdom on the earth. Therefore, the apostles' teaching was that no man should be deceived that the second coming of Jesus is in the past, or that it is close or at hand until the Antichrist has first been revealed. So we will know, if and when, we, if we are still alive when the Antichrist comes, that the coming of Jesus Christ is maybe another 42 months or thereabouts away, okay? It's not that far away. So that's what uh, the Antichrist comes just prior to the coming of Jesus Christ. So that is a major signal for everyone. You know, the people that uh, believers who I said may be alive, and I'm, I'm of the opinion of the understanding that 90% of us or most believers that are alive today will not be around to see that day. But if they are, then they'll know that uh, it is this uh, Antichrist may have come, but shortly thereafter is coming the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Therefore, the apostles' teaching was to the Thessalonians that no man should be deceived, that the second Jesus, the second coming of Jesus was in the past, or that it was closed until the Antichrist had first been revealed. So who or what is it that withholds, which stands in the way of the coming of Antichrist and who must be taken out of the way? There is an old Latin phrase called qui bono, okay? The meaning of which is, to whom is it a benefit? Basically, it means who benefits, okay? As we shall see, the revelation of the Antichrist is of no benefit whatsoever, but rather of incalculable loss to Satan. Therefore, it benefits him the most to withhold and to prevent the Antichrist from ever being revealed. He is not to be eagerly working towards bringing this beast into the world, okay? It is not in Satan's interest to be actively working to reveal the Antichrist. It is more in his interest to keep him hidden forever if he can. On this basis alone, the number one candidate for the title of the withholder or the restrainer is Satan. Now, there are plenty of other proofs provided in scripture to draw this conclusion with certainty. Okay. Let me take a quick look at 2 Thessalonians verses, chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. And then at Revelation chapter 12, in some detail to explain why Satan is he who now lets until he will be taken out of the way. The word letteth or let in verse 7 means to hold back, to restrain, to prevent, to stand in the way and has other such meanings. Okay. And if you look at the third definition of this Greek word, which is 2722 in the Strong's uh, Greek concordance, it is the word katecho. And it means one of the meanings is uh, to hold back, detain, to retain, to restrain, to hinder that which hinders Antichrist from making his appearance. Okay, so that is the meaning of the word. So the wording of verse seven strongly suggests that the power of the person that lets 
or that restrains the revelation of the Antichrist must first be taken out of the way. That is, it seems to imply that he must be forcibly removed for the mystery of iniquity, which is now working in the shadows, must be brought out into the open, but this person or power must first be removed. The phrase, he who now letteth, indicates that the one doing the letting is a he, that it is actually a person. Second Thessalonians verse two, uh, chapter two, verse seven, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, okay? Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. See that phrase, taken out of the way. It again implies somebody has to use force to get this power out of the way. And therefore, one of the most common teachings that the one who withholds is the person of the Holy Spirit. It cannot apply to that, okay? And I'll tell you why. Firstly, it should be apparent that if, the Holy, if it is the Holy Spirit that is withholding, then no power in all creation can ever take him out of the way. Secondly, following the principle of qui bono, of who benefits, it will become clear that the Holy Spirit benefits tremendously from the revealing of the Antichrist and therefore has no reason to withhold or to prevent or to restrain his revelation from ever occurring. On the other hand, Satan faces eternal loss, eternal loss shortly after, shortly after the revealing of this man of sin and will therefore fight to the bitter end to prevent the Antichrist from ever being revealed to the world. So let's again turn to Revelation chapter 12, in which certain events occur, immediately after which comes the Antichrist beast to wreak havoc on the world for a very short period of time. Like it says, the Bible tells us it's about 42 months. 42 months is a very, 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 it's like a nanosecond in, uh, the, in, 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 in comparison to the amount of time that has already gone by in the history of creation and the time that is to follow, which is eternity. So it's nothing, it's not even a drop in the bucket. It's like, you know, a blink of an eye and it'll be over. So this is a very, very short period of time. What we need to keep in mind is that the apostle Paul was not teaching the Thessalonians to look for the coming of the antichrist. He was just telling them, you know, that this must happen before Christ comes. But his subject, but, Okay, he was not telling them to look for the coming of the Antichrist, but that which will follow shortly thereafter, which will be the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. His subject was the day of Christ, not the day of the Antichrist. Therefore, all these people that I know again, like talking about the Antichrist day and night, they are deceiving you. Okay, it really is this whole teaching about the Antichrist. I have now come to the conclusion it is actually of little significance to us. What our eyes must be kept upon when it says, look up for your redemption draws nigh, not look down where the Antichrist is, okay? What we are looking for is the return and the second coming of Jesus Christ, not for this Antichrist. And as I said, most of us are not going to be alive to see it anyhow. So the coming of the Antichrist is actually a major sign for believers to look for Christ's second coming. But nowhere did the apostle teach that people should become obsessed with the coming of the Antichrist as people have been for hundreds of years. The Antichrist comes on the world stage in Revelation 13, but what happens immediately prior to the revealing to the world in Revelation 12? Something happens before Revelation 13 takes place, and I'm going to go into that. But before I go into Revelation 12, let's quickly look at Daniel 12.1, which was quoted by Rob in his email to me. Daniel 12.1 reads, and at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which stands for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. We are told that Michael will stand up at a time close to the end, a time of great trouble and tribulation for Daniel's people. But what will Michael stand up to do? Okay, it's told us he will stand up, but what is he going to do? To understand that, we should look at Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. And what verse 7 tells us is there was, a, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. As we read in Ephesians 6, 12, 
Satan and his principalities have a place in the heavenly realms above us from which Satan will one day be removed. He will be cast down. He will be taken out of the way and be forced to limit his activities to the earth only. He does not have a place in the heaven, which is the city of God, from which God rules and reigns over all creation. And because the heaven where Christ sitteth, we are told that Christ has ascended far above all principality and power in uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 21. So that city is beyond the reach of Satan or any of these evil principalities, okay? So what, uh, so what this war between Michael and Satan accomplishes, so these, uh, these principalities and powers, as I've thought many times, they are locate, located somewhere in the atmosphere above the earth, but I believe below the firmament, they are not in the city or the, uh, the, the kingdom, the place where uh, the throne of God's, uh, the, where the throne of God is set, okay? So what this war between Michael and Satan accomplishes is to remove Satan from the heavenly realms and to cast him down to earth, to take him out of the way from the atmosphere above us in which will soon appear Christ Jesus in the clouds as written in many places in the Bible. That appearance of Christ, as for example, we read in Revelation 14, 14, will not occur until all these principalities and powers have been wiped out of the heavenly realms above us and being cast down to the earth. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 6, we read that this son of perdition will be revealed in his time. Okay? What this means is that there is a time appointed at which the Antichrist will appear, appear, declare himself to be God for a short time, and will then go straight into perdition, into the lake of fire. This time of the Antichrist has been appointed by none other than God himself. And there is no power that can change this time or prevent his appearing at the appointed time, even if such power or powers fight with all their might to withhold the appearing of the Antichrist. Obviously, there is someone that is trying to withhold it, as we are told in scripture. So therefore, only thing we need to determine is who is it that is doing the withholding. Immediately after the Revelation 12 war in the heavenly realms, who makes an appearance in, in the world in Revelation 13? Why is none other than the Antichrist beast who begins to work miracles and show wonders to a deluded world that he is God? Revelation 13, 2, we read, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So the Antichrist, Antichrist beast is given his power by the dragon, who was identified as Satan in Revelation 12, 9. This is exactly what is written in First. Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, that the man of sin will be empowered by Satan to show great signs and lying wonders. The point here is that in 2 Thessalonians, we are told that this person, he must be taken out of the way before the man of sin can be revealed. So what happens in Revelation 12? Satan is taken out of the way. He's cast down to the earth. And then in Revelation 13, the Antichrist makes an appearance. So these are the same events that are written about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and in Revelation chapter 12 and 13. Okay. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, we read, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, which we read about in Revelation chapter 19. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. And again, you can read that in uh, Revelation 13, that it is Satan, the dragon, which gives power to the beast. Okay. It is only say, un, it is not until Satan is forcibly taken out of the way by Michael that the man of sin, the son of perdition, appears on the scene. So obviously in his time, as appointed by God, can only arrive after Satan is cast down, after he is taken out of the way in the heavenly realms. Only then can this beast be revealed. So in order for Christ to return, the Antichrist must first come. In order for the Antichrist to come, the war in the heavens must first take place. And for Satan and his principalities to be first taken out of the way in the heavens and to be cast down to the earth. So as long as Satan is still operating in the heavenly realms, the Antichrist cannot be revealed. 
and until the son of perdition has been revealed, the second coming of the Lord Jesus cannot take place. Therefore, this war in the heavens lead, leads directly to the revealing of the Antichrist to be followed shortly thereafter by the second coming of Jesus Christ. So how do we know that Satan is the one trying to prevent the coming of the Antichrist, not eagerly chomping at the beats to make it happen, that it is not the Holy Spirit or Michael? As far as the Holy Spirit is concerned, we can read in Psalm 139 that there is no place in creation where the Holy Spirit may not be found, even in the depths of hell itself. Moreover, God says that he fills all creation. So again, there can be no place in creation that can ever be absent of the Spirit of God. We also know that there still will be some believers left on the earth at Christ's second coming. So how can the Spirit of God leave the earth? Will not the Holy Spirit still be found in those believers? So this teaching also we see from the principle of qui bono, that God and the Holy Spirit and Jesus greatly benefit from the revealing of the Antichrist because what follows is the kingdom of Christ on earth and actually for Satan to reveal him by sending Michael to war with Satan and to cast him down to earth. They do not try and restrain the coming of the Antichrist. Michael himself is instrumental in taking Satan, the restrainer out of the way so that the man of sin can be revealed. So obviously he is not trying to restrain the beast. He is forcing Satan to reveal the beast. Therefore, neither the Holy Spirit nor Michael can be proven to be the ones that are withholding the revealing of the son of perdition. People teach, you know, people that teach that Satan is all eager and anxious to reveal the Antichrist do not study scripture with the mind of Christ, which is the logos, which means logic and reason. Like a cornered rat, Satan will fight to the end to try and prevent the Antichrist from ever being revealed, but in the end, he will lose and he will be forced to bring him on the world stage. And, you know, that is the operative phrase is that he will be forced. It is not something he wants to do, but he will be forced to do so. How do we know this for sure? We know that at the time of the end, that the time of the Antichrist in Revelation 13 immediately follows the war in the heavens above us, which means that the Antichrist cannot be revealed until Satan is cast out of the heavens and forced to continue his evil work from the earth, not from the heavenly realms. The heavenly realms have to be cleansed of all evil before the sign of the Son of Man of Jesus Christ can be seen in the heavens, which is seen in Revelation 14, immediately following Revelation 13. Having read the book of Revelation from the very moment that it was written, Satan knows that as soon as his war is over, he has to reveal the beast and the false prophet, and very shortly thereafter, he himself has to follow these two characters into eternal perdition. So using the principle of qui bono, who benefits, we see that Satan is the great loser in this drama, whose end is signaled by the arrival of the Antichrist. Satan knows that his role in this drama will be finished forever, that he will have but a short time once the man of sin has been revealed. Therefore, he has been fighting since the day the apostle John wrote the book of Revelation to try and prevent the coming of the Antichrist, to never see him revealed ever, okay? Now look at Revelation 12, 12. What does it say? Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. So what is the devil's reaction to the arrival of the appointed time of the Antichrist? We can read in verse 12 that he starts jumping for joy now that finally the Holy Spirit has been taken out of the way and he can now reveal this man of sin that he's been chomping at the bits to do so for ages. Is that what the Bible teaches us? No. What we read is that he is filled with wrath when this time arrives. Actually, we read that he has great wrath. This is is that not quite the opposite of what I've been taught for so long, that the devil is chomping at the pits to reveal the Antichrist, that the Holy Spirit has to really work hard to restrain him? That's what they teach you, right? So then why is Satan filled with great wrath when that happens? So if the Holy Spirit finally stops restraining him, should not Satan be thrilled and start doing like a snake dance or something, you know, that finally he can do what he's been waiting to do for 2,000 years? When we understand who loses 
qui bono, who loses and who wins by the revealing of the beast and the false prophet. It makes total logical logos, mind of Christ sense that the last person that wants to see the day of the Antichrist is Satan because it spells for him, not just a small loss, but eternal destruction. It brings his eternal torment, his, return, his prophesied eternal torment to the present from the future. Now, does his rage and great wrath make sense? This event of the revealing of the Antichrist fills Satan with rage, which is why he tries to destroy the remnant of believers still left alive on earth by the time, uh, by that time, as we can read in Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So Satan's reaction to the revealing of his beloved Antichrist, as people have been teaching us for ages, is totally out of character. If he truly wanted to see this day more than anything else, he should rejoice at that time, not be filled with great wrath. Now let's use the test of qui bono, who benefits, to see who benefits and who loses when the time of the Antichrist finally arrives. Okay, As written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, the subject of that chapter is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Although the apostle also wrote about the coming of the man of sin prior to the second coming of Jesus, the revealing of the man of sin is not the main event. It is the coming of the son of man. Similarly, Revelation chapter 12 details the war in the heavenly realms between Michael and Satan and their armies. But again, the main event is not the war of the casting down of Satan to earth, but the coming kingdom of Jesus Christ. Revelation 12, 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of God, our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. So although there seems to have been a major war between the host of heaven led by Michael and the evil principalities and powers now residing in the heavens, but the conclusion of the war brings about the main event, which is the kingdom of God and of Christ on earth. It is clearly understood that this war will be followed by the coming of the Antichrist in Revelation 13. But from God's perspective, that is a minor event. The main event is the second coming of Christ which is signaled by the appearance of the Son of Man in Revelation 14, 14. And I looked and behold the white cloud and upon the cloud sat one like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown and his, in his hand a sharp sickle. Do you understand the significance of this year, about this war, what this war did? In this war, it took Satan out of the, and their principalities and evil powers, evil principalities and powers out of the heavenly realms and cast them out. The heavens are now clear, okay? And therefore, we have to, the heavens are now cleared of all evil and now appears the Son of Man in these heavens where evil no longer resides. And this cleansing of the heavens occurs because of this war. And it is because of this war that the Antichrist is revealed to the whole world. Okay, I will discuss this appearance of the Son of Man in a cloud in the heavens after Satan has been cast out of the heavens. But before I do, let's look at who rejoices and who is wrathful, who benefits and who loses from the appearance of the Antichrist after Satan and his principality is cast down to the earth from the heavenly realms. Let's read Revelation 12 from verse 9 to verse 12. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So again, the Bible doesn't leave any doubt that this, this creature is Satan. Okay which deceiveth the whole world, and he was cast out into the earth and his angels, meaning his evil spirits. You know, a lot of people read this as, you know, these are the fallen angels that God created in the beginning. No, this is not the fallen angel. The word angel means messenger. It means spirit. So, you know, these are the messengers and evil spirits of Satan that are cast out there. These are not the angels of God that God created that sinned against him because they are locked away in hell awaiting the day of judgment. They are not here to come and uh, to fight, to come and, uh, you know, to, to work their evil any longer. They were locked away a long time before uh, this age. Okay? So that's what this means, this word angels, the use of this word angels. He was cast out in the earth as angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ 
for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore, this, of course, loving not their lives unto the death will be because at that time the Antichrist is going to put to death all those people who will refuse the mark. And uh, that's what these people are. They will not love their lives unto the unto the death. They will hold on to the word of their testimony and they will be cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he has but a short time. First of all, the casting down of Satan and his evil host down to the earth, soon to be followed by the 42 months or thereabouts, reign of Antichrist, and not seen with alarm by the, heaven, by the heavenly host of God. They are not concerned that the man of sin will soon be revealed. The voice in heaven heard by John proclaims victory saying that this is the time of salvation and strength and kingdom of God and the power of his Christ, which has this time, which has arrived, is all these positive and good things that creation has been waiting for for a very long time. Okay. Verse 11 tells us that the believers will overcome even when their lives will be taken by the Antichrist. They will not love their lives even unto the death. Okay. So it's a great time of great testimony of great faith by these believers that will still be alive at that time. But it is in verse 12 that we see that the casting down of Satan and the soon coming time of the Antichrist will be a time for the heavens to rejoice. Okay, If it was that the Holy Spirit is working so hard to restrain him, you know, why should be they, these people be told to rejoice? Why shouldn't they say, oh no, the Antichrist is here now. You guys all be fearful? No. That's not what we are told. We are told that the heavens rejoice because this war has taken place. And even though the Antichrist is going to be revealed soon, they say, tell us that it's a time of rejoicing. Why? Is it because the Antichrist has been revealed? No, because the Son of Man will soon be revealed. This reaction is quite the opposite of that of Satan, who is filled with great wrath at this time, when his beloved man of sin will finally be revealed. Is that not what we mean taught that Satan is ever so eager to reveal the Antichrist, but the Holy Spirit? is restraining him from doing so. So should not this be a time of rejoicing for him and a time of sorrow for everyone else? What has happened that Satan will be filled with great wrath at, wrath at that time instead of giving high fives to everyone that he has finally won and finally managed to reveal him who he has kept hidden for ages? The answer is that this is not a time of victory for Satan, but a time of his greatest loss when he is going to lose everything not only will he have lost all his principalities in the heavens that he has ruled over for eons, but he is on the brink of losing his greatest prized possession, the world of men that sits on the earth. And he is finally to be cast into the lake of fire to be tormented forever and ever. He knows that time is coming. And when the Antichrist appears, he knows that his game is over. Soon as he's cast down to the earth, he knows that the time appointed by God for the revealing of the Antichrist will have arrived. And that will mean that his own time as God of this world will very soon come to an end. So qui bono, who benefits? Certainly not Satan. He will be the biggest loser at the end, very soon after the time that the son of perdition will be revealed. Satan has read the book, meaning the Bible, but especially the book of Revelation from the very moment it was written. And he knows that the one person whose arrival he cannot afford to see is the Antichrist. Therefore, it is in his interest, more than that of any other person, to withhold this revelation, to keep the man of sin hidden forever, if it was in his power to do so. He would keep him hidden forever. So rather than derive any benefits from this appearing, Satan will be set to lose everything. So qui bono? Who benefits? Okay, let's ask that question. Let's answer it. Does God benefit? Of course, he benefits. The revealing of the Antichrist, which is of little concern to God, causes Satan to be filled with wrath, knowing that his time is short, short, and God will use Satan's wrath to pour out his own wrath upon this evil world. God uses Satan to bring judgment. And this time, when it's the time of God's fierce wrath, he is also, you know, built Satan up into this wrath, and he is going to use that to judge the evil world. And finally, he will end this world so that he can reveal his Christ and his eternal kingdom to all of creation. God has been waiting 
since the beginning of creation for this time to arrive. So a minor event like the coming of the Antichrist, which must precede the second coming of Jesus Christ, actually served the purposes of God. Therefore, God will never withhold the revealing of this beast. He will actually force Satan to reveal him by having him cast down to the earth, which is the signal for Satan that his time will soon be up. Knowing that his time will be up and having no choice in the matter, like a cornered rat, Satan will unleash the Antichrist beast on an unrepentant evil world. In so doing, he will be lashing out in rage, but his rage and the destruction that will bring will only serve to pass God's judgment on the world that has served Satan and worshipped him as God since the Garden of Eden. Does it not say that he will sit, you know, showing himself to be God? And that's what it is. Satan is on the earth and he's, he's the resident spirit in this beast. And therefore he is again showing himself to be God. And the coming of the Antichrist is one of God's final judgments on the world. So the teaching that the Holy Spirit is working hard to restrain the Antichrist is a patently false teaching. Sadly, almost everything that the church so-called has ever taught in the past almost 2000 years since the time of the apostles has been false. So we have to go back, we have to study the scriptures and we have to understand what the Bible is teaching, not what all these you know, so-called prophecy teachers and all the prophecy channel and everything else, club and all those places have been teaching us. So does Jesus benefit from the revealing of the Antichrist? The Apostle Paul made it clear that the day of Christ, his second coming, cannot take place unless the man of sin is first revealed. So rather than restraining and withholding this revealing, Christ would like to see that day come sooner rather than later, for it means that he will be crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords and will rule, rule and reign forever. And moreover, he will be with his bride forever, for whom he paid the ultimate price and laid down his own life. Just like Satan knows that he will have but a short time once the Antichrist is revealed, so does Jesus know that soon after the son of perdition is revealed, in a matter, within a matter of months, about 40 months, 42 months or so, he will finally be revealed to claim his kingdom and his bride. And in this term of 42 months, it's very short. You know, when you look back, this COVID business, it's going on like 30 months or something. So it is soon be 42 months since this COVID operation began. Okay, so 42 months is a very short time, very, very short time. So he will finally be returning. Jesus will finally be returning once this Antichrist had been revealed after a few short months, he will finally be returning to claim his kingdom and his bride. Therefore, the time of the Antichrist signals the coming of Christ, which is a time of rejoicing for the bride of Christ, a time of rejoicing in the heavens and in all creation, a time of victory, not a time of loss for Jesus and all who believe in it. Therefore, he has no interest in restraining the revealing of this man of sin. Does Michael and the heavenly host of God benefit? The archangel Michael actually forces the hand of Satan by casting him down to earth so that he can reveal the man of sin, a person that Satan wants desperately to keep hidden forever. By casting down Satan and forcing him to bring the Antichrist into the open, Michael prepares the way for the second coming of Christ. He removes all the evil principalities from the heavenly realms. And very shortly after, the son of man is seen in the heavens coming with the clouds, as we read in Revelation 14, 14. And I looked and behold, the white cloud. And upon the cloud sat one like unto the son of man, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. So Michael does not restrain Satan from revealing the Antichrist. He actually forces him to do so. Again, it is a false teaching that Michael is restraining the Antichrist when in fact he is instrumental in the Antichrist being revealed. By removing evil principalities that have been domiciled in the heavens for ages, Michael not only prepares the way for the return of Christ, but he also makes it a, a time of rejoicing for the other residents of the heavens who also have been persecuted and tormented by Satan for a very long time. This is why the residents of the heavenly realms are told to rejoice, not to be filled with sorrow or rage, as happens to Satan when that time will arrive. Why? Because they benefit. Revelation 12, 12. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. 
So do the believers or the bride of Christ benefit from the revealing of the Antichrist? The short answer to that question is yes, they do. Shortly after the war in the heavens and after a period of only about 42 months, the Son of Man will be seen in the now free of evil heavens, gathering together his elect from one end of heaven to the other. The promise of salvation, which has been promised to all believers and to the bride of Christ, may now finally be fulfilled, and the believers will be transformed in the twinkling of an eye into immortal, incorruptible, perfect in holiness, righteousness, and love, new creatures in Christ who will forever be for, with, with, with Jesus. So even though the Antichrist comes, knowing that Christ is following right behind, is it going to benefit the believers? Yes, of course it is. So why would they want to be the ones that try to restrain this appearance? No, they want this thing to be done and over with. They want to see this day because they know that it is not that they are the Antichrist they're waiting for. They're waiting for the day of Christ, and the day of Christ cannot come until the man of sin has been revealed. Okay. So we can see that the revealing of the Antichrist will soon be followed by the second coming for which all creation has been waiting since the very beginning of creation. This will be a time of great victory for everyone except Satan and his evil host, who will be the biggest losers of all. Therefore, it is not in anyone's interest except Satan's to keep the Antichrist under wraps for as long as he possibly can. But when the time appointed by God for the revealing of the man of sin will be at hand, neither Satan nor any of the power will be able to restrain or prevent this from happening. So as I said, you know, I have already done a video on this subject, but this is again adding to that. So I hope that... Uh, you know, this is something that has made sense to you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, where we go, stop share. There we go. Uh, the following is part two to this uh, topic of who is the restrainer. And this was recorded on June uh, 11th, 2022. All right. So we read here in verse in chapter two, verse one. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him. So right in the very first verse of this chapter, the Apostle Paul introduces his subject. And his subject is the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is what's called, commonly called the second coming. Okay, so the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's what the subject is. And when he comes, what is he coming to do? First of all, he is going to gather together unto him all his elect as we can read in Matthew 24, 31, in Revelation chapter 4, 14, verses 14 to 16, and other passages of scripture in Luke, Mark, etc., that Jesus, when he comes, and he's before he even lands on the earth, the first thing he does while he's still above in the sky, visible to every eye on earth, is that he's going to gather together all his elect with him. Okay, So that's what the subject here is. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not shaken, soon shaken in mind or trouble, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, that the day of Christ is at hand. So here he is going to this, the complete sentence, verse two and verse, well, verse uh, sorry, chapter two, verse one and two. This is one sentence. And in this, Paul introduces the subject, which is say it is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, when he comes, he's going to gather us all together with him. And what I'm going to explain to you now is the is how we will know that it is time that that time has now arrived or is that close at hand. So he's going to give them some signs that, you know, hey, watch for this. And when you see this, then you know that that day of the Lord is going to be hand. He says, because we have not seen these things yet, that day is not here yet. OK, that's as simple as that. And, you know, these teachings were, why he was writing them, this teaching was, that people were already teaching back in that day while the apostle was still alive, that, you know, oh, it's Jesus has already returned. The second coming has already taken place. The resurrection is past. And these teachings are already there. And, you know, don't you think they're all, they, these things are still among us? Yes, they are. People are already teaching out there, you know, the millennial is already behind. We are living in the post-millennial kingdom. Jesus' second coming has already taken place. Okay. 
And that's why the scriptures have been written so they can teach us what to look for. So now in verse three onwards, he's gonna give them a whole, what to look for that is going to prove to them beyond doubt that the day of Christ is at hand. So now let's keep this in mind that the subject here is the day of Christ. It is not the day of the antichrist. So in verse three, he says, let no man deceive you by any means for that they shall not come, except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he is God sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Okay, so this again, like one sentence, verse three and four. So he has told them that, you know, hey guys, you know, I'm writing to you that uh, what we are watching for is the second coming of Jesus and us gathering together unto him. But don't be, you know, alarmed that he has already come and he's, you know, you've been left behind like all those left behind books and movies, garbage, lies, corruption, more. You know, everything that is heavily promoted out there, you know, just throw it away. Don't waste your time on it. Promoting this pre-tribulation rapture lies and everything else. Anyways, let's continue. So that's what's happening. But he said, you know, now people are going to deceive you. What are they going to deceive you? That Jesus has come. Jesus himself told us in Matthew, many shall come in my name saying that I am Christ. And he said, go not after them. If they tell you he's in the desert, he's already arrived. He's here, there. You know, don't listen to them. Okay. So he said, let no man deceive you by any means for that they shall not come. And he's going to give them a whole series of things to look for, except there come a falling away first. Okay. And I've heard people trying to teach this, you know, twist this into saying this falling away is basically a departure from the faith, which has already happened in this world, happened a long time ago. But in the end, even despite God giving them sign after sign, sending prophets like he's always has throughout history to demonstrate to them his power and to preach to them the gospel, people are still going to reject him. Okay, and that is what that falling away is, which we read about, for example, in Revelation chapter 11, even after the two witnesses have testified, they have preached the gospel in the whole world as we have prophesied in Matthew 24 that they must do yet people will not believe. So that's the falling away. And then he says that that happens. People reject the gospel. They reject God who has displayed to them his power, like in, the, in these two witnesses, like he probably has never done since even the days of Moses or something, okay? Jesus said, you know, greater works than these shall you do. And these prophets certainly are going to do things which Jesus himself did not do. And yet people will not believe. And therefore that falling away happens. And then he says, after that, that man of sin will be revealed, the son of perdition. That in itself is a study which I will undertake one day as to the exact terminology that is used, man of sin and the son of perdition. But what is his, what does this man of sin and son of perdition do? He says he opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he is God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So basically what he is doing is that he is setting himself up as God, okay, that all that belongs to God, the glory, the worship, the honor, he is assigning that to himself. And uh, that as a matter of fact is you could say a judgment from God because God was rejected by these people and therefore god is going to give them another god except it is not going to be god who is love it is going to be satan who is the enemy of the souls of these people and this enemy is going to be we shall see soon has going to be filled with great wrath great wrath and he is going to devour them like you know and cause tribulation like never ever seen ever in the history of creation we are told Okay, so this is what we look for, that, you know, yes, this great falling away comes, the man of sin is revealed, he is going to set himself and he's going to be exalting himself above all that is called God, and he's going to set himself up as God, okay? And uh, this, when that happens, what is that a sign of? 
is that a sign that, you know, this is the great day we were waiting for, that the Antichrist is coming and he has now arrived? No. What it is a sign is that the coming of Christ is at hand. The Bible, as I told you, is always about Jesus Christ. It is not about the Antichrist. The Antichrist is one sign for people that will still be alive at that time. It's going to be a major one that once this creature has been revealed, then you know people know that the coming of Christ is right at the doorstep. It is maybe another 42 or so months away. And uh, that's all the time that is left. And they can rejoice. They can look up for their redemption draws near. Not just draws near, they'll be able to see him up in the sky. All right. So that's what the signs that Basel is giving them. It is not that, you know, about to look for the revelation of the Antichrist. What he's saying is the subject was the coming of Jesus Christ, how to identify when we will know that the day of Christ is at hand. He said one of the major signs is going to be is the revelation of this Antichrist, okay? Remember ye not, when I was with you, I told you these things. So, you know, Apostle, again, he had taught them these things, and the same thing, we have talked about these things frequently, and uh, it is good to bring them to our mind and to remember them again and again and again. And now you know what the withholds that he might be revealed in his time. So this year, is again, the apostle is bringing to memory things that have already been taught because we forget, you know, it's good to refresh ourselves. And that's why these teachings, especially about the end times, which, uh, you know, I have literally like dozens of videos on this uh, book of Revelation, Matthew, the Gospels, uh, etc. But it's good to go through them because every time we revisit those topics, you know, I personally myself learn more. And, uh, you know, we are, our understanding grows and grows and grows. So that's why it is good to remember to bring these things to mind again. And now you know what to be the holes that he might be revealed in his time. Okay, so there is a time at which this revelation of this Antichrist is going to take place. But again, is that the event that we are all waiting for? Is the revelation of the Antichrist? No, what we are waiting for is the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and to be gathered together unto him, as the apostle already told us in verse one was the subject of this letter, okay, of this chapter anyhow. So what we learn here is that yes, that in order for Christ to come, first sign is going to be, one of the major signs is going to be that the son of perdition the man of sin is going to be revealed to the whole world, okay? But now the apostle is saying in verse six is that there is someone or something that is withholding this revelation, okay? That is holding back the revealing of this antichrist. Now, is it because, is it like, you know, this power that is doing this withholding, what is the reason for it? What is the motivation behind it? Okay, is it anything to do at all with the Antichrist? And you know what I will say, no. What is happening is, what is this restrainer actually restraining? What this restrainer is restraining is the coming of Jesus Christ, not so much the coming of the Antichrist. Now the coming of the Antichrist has to precede the coming of Jesus Christ. Therefore, the person that's doing this withholding knows that as long as this Antichrist can be withheld, can be restrained, therefore Jesus Christ won't come. It's as simple as that. So again, it goes back to what was the subject of the chapter. It was the coming of Jesus Christ. So the motive of this restrainer is to prevent the coming of Jesus Christ, not so much the coming of the Antichrist. Okay. So the Antichrist in this whole story is not really the central figure. And his arrival is not the main event. You know, when you have wrestling matches, you know, they have these or boxing matches or something, you know, like big, I don't know who the boxers are these days, but back in the day, you know, when he used to be like Muhammad Ali and George Foreman or somebody or, you know, Mike Tyson and Evander Holyfield or someone like that, you know, that's when I used to still, you know, be watching sports and all that kind of stuff. Don't waste my time with that nonsense anymore, those distractions anymore. You know, it used to be that, you know, before their fight, they used to have like three, four, five, six different fights, you know, like, I don't know, like a few of them anyways, 
which were leading up to this main event. Okay, so this coming of the Antichrist, you could say, is like a little preview of the main feature which is going to play, which is going to be the coming of Jesus Christ. So it just happens that his story has to play out first for a very short period of time of some 42 months, and then Jesus will come, okay? So whoever the restrainer is, he knows that, you know, if he can stop this Antichrist, then, you know, Jesus Christ cannot come. So that is the motivation. You always look for motive, right? What is the motive? Like, you know, you have to do some detective work when you're reading scripture to be like Sherlock Holmes. You know, if a crime has been committed, what is the motivation? And that's what we're looking here is, okay, we are told that, you know, you know what withholds that he might be revealed in his time. So first of all, we know that there is a certain time at which he is going to be revealed. And who is the setter of times? It's God. Okay, so God has set a time at which he is going to be revealed. But until then, somebody is trying desperately to not allow this to happen because they know that once this happens, what's going to fall soon is Jesus is coming. So somebody is trying to prevent the second coming, not so much the coming of the Antichrist. All right. Okay, continue verse seven. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Okay, the mystery of iniquity, which literally is Satan, as we shall see right here in this very, in these three verses of scripture, which is, uh, you know, that, uh, it, uh, okay, let's read verse seven. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now lets will let until he be taken out of the way. That's a very, very, the way that word, that this, 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 this verse of scripture is worded, it teaches us a lot. He said the mystery of iniquity does already work. So what this mystery of iniquity, of course, is the evil one, is Satan, okay? He has been working in this world since the Garden of Eden, and he has shaped this world. He has created this world. And I don't mean created the earth. Okay? God created the earth. The Satan has created the world, which means the systems, the political systems, the religious systems, the economic systems, the military, media, whatever that, you know, is involved in life in this earth has been created by Satan. And he is the God of this world. So he's been manufacturing, he's been creating and shaping this world since that time. And I'm sure over that past, you know, thousands of years, he's pretty much perfected it the way he wants it to be. Okay. So he is that mystery of iniquity. And he has been working in our world always since the Garden of Eden. And uh, therefore, it says that the mystery of iniquity does already work, okay? Only he who now lets will let until he be taken out of the way. He said the worst tree is working, but there's going to be something that is going to happen, which is going to reveal this mystery to the whole world. Okay? Right now, it's working from behind the scenes. It must be revealed and brought out into the open literally in physical form that people can see that this is the power that has been running this world since the time of the Garden of Eden. It is going to be exposed. You could literally say Satan is going to be exposed on the whole world stage. Right now he works from behind the scenes. Right now he sits up in the heavenly realms from which he controls the powers, you know, that be, so to speak, in the, in the, in the realm of man. And, uh, using his evil spirits he has created kingdoms and dominions and you know lordships and all that stuff but it is now going to be exp exposed like that movie the visit of Oz. you know the curtain is going to be lifted and we're going to find out who is the, who is this power that was behind these scenes that's what's going to happen but again somebody is preventing this from happening and then we are told, until he be taken out of the way. I love that expression, T be taken out of the way. A lot of people teach, you know, that this uh, restrainer is the Holy Spirit. That's the most common teaching, okay? But this expression, until he be taken out of the way, it is not that, you know, God saying that, you know, I'm going to step out of the way or whatever. No, it gives that vivid imagery of somebody grabbing like you know satan is grabbed by the angel at the end of the you know at the time of armageddon 
and he is thrown into the bottomless pit, he's chained. That's the kind of imagery that he evokes here is that some power has to come and remove something out of the way before this revelation of the Antichrist can take place so that the coming of Jesus Christ is not hindered. That's what this means, okay? So this power that is standing or person in this, in this verse of scripture, it is identified as a person because it tells us only he who now lets will let until he be taken out of the way. So it is a he, it is a person that must be removed, okay? And uh, who is this person and why is he letting? And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. So once the wicked has been revealed, who's coming right after that? The Lord Jesus. And what's the Lord Jesus going to do? Is he going to be concerned? Is he going to be trembling in fear? that you know, the Antichrist is on the earth. Now he's gonna come and he's gonna blow him away, okay? And then shall the wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall confuse, consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him, this is a very, very important verse of scripture as to identify who this Antichrist is, okay? That people talk all the time, oh, the Antichrist is Donald Trump. Oh, the Antichrist is Obama. Oh, the Antichrist is the Pope. But we shall see who this is, okay? It's right here. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all powers and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved, okay? Who is the power in this Antichrist? It's identified right here in verse 9, as it is also in uh, Revelation chapter 12, that the Antichrist's power, the Antichrist spirit that sits in whoever this person is, is Satan. So you could literally say that the Antichrist is Satan in the flesh. That's who it is, okay? It doesn't matter what the shell on the outside looks like, whether it looks like Donald Trump or it looks like the Pope or the Queen or the King or whatever, it does not matter one bit. What matters is what is the spirit that sits inside that body, inside the shell, and it is Satan. That's who it is. Even him who's coming is after the working of Satan with all signs and wonders and, and sign and all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved, okay? So the love of the truth is already here. The truth is already here. It's always been in our world, even like, you know, before Jesus came, the prophets of God were there. The word of God was already being taught in the world. You know, God's knowledge was already increasing, but especially after Jesus Christ, and especially after the Bible has been written, his knowledge that he wants man to have in this time has been completed. But even then, God being merciful, he is still sending teachers out all the time. And in the days of the two witnesses, he is once again going to preach to the whole world. And he's going to tell them, now you repent and you change and you turn to me and they're going to reject him. And because they believe that, what has happened? The great falling away. And the great falling away happens. What happens? The Antichrist is revealed. And once the Antichrist is revealed, what do they do? They worship him as God. So that is the delusion because they rejected the true and living God. God has sent him. The very creature who is their enemy as their God. And what is he going to do? Is he going to love them like God loves them and give them life? No, he is going to destroy them. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they, shall, they should believe a lie. What is the lie? The lie is that this creature in whom sits Satan is God, okay? They might be all might be damned to believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Okay. So now we understand, having understood that this restrainer, the purpose of the motive of the restrainer is that he wants to prevent the second coming of Jesus Christ, not the coming of the Antichrist. So let's quickly go through again to Revelation 12. And this is going to teach us who this restrainer is. 
because we are told that certain things must happen before the coming of Jesus Christ, okay? Number one, that uh, this falling away happens, this man of sin is revealed, and in order for the man of sin to be revealed, there is a power that stands to restrain, that power must be taken out of the way, okay? Let's see where we read in scripture of some power that is right now working the mystery of iniquity that is taken out of the way and then this antichrist is revealed and that is in revelation chapter 12. this chapter 12 we're going to do a study on it when we get to it in detail but i just want to go through it briefly especially about this war between michael and satan okay because what we shall see is that satan is taken out of the taken out of the way in the heavenly realms and once he is and he's cast down to earth what happens is he comes and he literally embodies this creature, this man of sin, and that is the Antichrist, okay? Therefore, this taking out of the way, it applies to Satan because he was the one that was restraining this coming of the Antichrist, not because he is concerned that the Antichrist is going to be revealed because he knows what follows shortly thereafter is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus comes back, he also knows that his time is finally going to be over forever. And his destination is the lake of fire. Now, if you were in his shoes and he knew that was going to happen to you and the one sign that it, 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 that time had arrived was the appearance of this antichrist, would you do everything in your power to try and stop that from happening? I would think so. Would you even go to war and fight to stop it from happening, I would say so, okay? So we know this year, there's, you know, that let's go to verse seven in Revelation chapter 12, I just wanna go through it quickly. And there was war in heaven. And as I've explained, so I'm not gonna go through it in detail here, that this heaven is not like talking about the city of heaven, which is the city of God, where the throne of God is situated. This is, these are the heavenly realms where the principalities and powers reside. These principalities and powers, they are in the atmosphere above us. They are above the earth, but I believe they're below the firmament. Okay? Because Jesus, when he ascended, we read in Ephesians 1.21, that he ascended far above all principality and power. So where did he ascend to? He ascended to the throne of God. So that tells us that the throne of God is far above all principality and power. Therefore, these principalities and powers are not on the earth, but they are not in heaven either. So they're somewhere in between. So that's where this war takes place. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels. Okay. So both of these are, there's the, 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 the Bible, the word host means army. So you have the host of heaven led by Michael. And then of course the dragon, which will be identified in uh, verse nine as Satan. He has his own army. Angels meaning not, not, not angels of God, but his angels, which are his messengers, his spirits, because the word angel means messenger and spirit. These are his evil spirits. So they fight. And why do they fight? While he's fighting, because he does not want to be cast down to the earth. He wants to stay up there. He has principalities. A principality means uh, a region or an area over which is ruled over by a prince. And who is the prince of darkness? It is Satan. So he has his headquarters up there somewhere from which he rules his world, his domain, his dominion, which is especially on this earth, but we understand from Revelation 12 that some of this is also in the heavenly places. All right. So he does not want to be cast out of there because his casting down is a sure sign that he is now the time of the revelation of the Antichrist has now come. And soon as the Antichrist is revealed, Jesus Christ is right at the doorstep. And that is one day Satan does not want to see. Okay. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven, meaning in the heavenly realms. So as we read in Ephesians 6.12, that these principalities of power, they reside in the heavenly places above the earth, they are cast down from there. Now their domain is going to be restricted strictly to the earth. Okay? And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, okay? the devil. So he is the chief devil. He is the prince of darkness. 
He is the head honcho. His name is Satan, okay? which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So essentially, Michael comes and he takes Satan out of the way of the heavenly realms. He cleans the heavens, you could say, casts all darkness and evil spirits down to the earth. And we shall see, as soon as Michael does that, very shortly thereafter, who appears in the heavens? Jesus Christ appears. Okay, So these heavens have to be cleansed of this evil and darkness before Jesus will come through them, pass through them, coming back down to the earth. And whatever evil is left is all concentrated on the earth that Jesus is going to destroy himself. And then he is going to set up his righteous kingdom on the earth. There's beautiful symmetry in the Bible, how all these things happen. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength. Okay. This voice did not cry out loudly. He said, now is come the Antichrist. Oh, my God. No, 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 no. They rejoice. They say this is a great time. That something great is happening here. Okay, so they, the, 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 the righteous up there, they are actually rejoicing at this time, even though they know that the Antichrist is going to be coming. But, you know, that is not of any concern to them, and neither is it of any concern to God, because he knows he's going to come and consume him. He just also knows that it has to happen. So the time that was allotted, like is read in... Uh, in uh, Second Thessalonians, that he will be revealed in his time has now come, even though Satan tried to stop that from coming. And I heard, heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength and kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which cast them before our God day and night. Okay, so this accuser of the brethren, and somebody had asked the question in an email, you know, that uh, does that mean that Satan actually goes up to the heaven of God? No, I don't believe so. His accusations can certainly pass on to God, like in in, uh, in Revelation in chapter five or in chapter six. You know, we have read chapter seven. We we have read about chapter eight actually about the, you know the angel taking the censer, which is the prayers of the saints. You know, there's more than one passage which talks about these prayers of the saints. You know, they're sending up to heaven. So, you know, if our prayers can reach up from here up to God, I'm sure the accusations of Satan can also pass on to him without him actually being right in the presence of God in the heaven of God. Okay. So, no, I do not believe he is in the in the heaven. He is in the heavenly realms right now, which is where his headquarters are and from which he is going to be cast down. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives unto the death. Okay. So those who are not going to be falling away, they are of course, as we shall read in chapter 13, given a choice, you know, take the mark or die, and they will die. They will not love their lives unto the death. So this is a time of overcoming for them. This is, again, not a time of fear that you know, the Antichrist has come or something, not concerned whatsoever to them, to anybody in the heavenly realms and believers on the earth. They're not concerned with it because they are not looking for the Antichrist. They are looking for Jesus Christ. Therefore, rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Look at that. So this great time, which is prophesied to come, which in you know, a books have been written about, which movies have been made about more beyond that you can count about the Antichrist, Antichrist, Antichrist. But what does it tell you? Rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows he has but a short time. So the heavens are again told that the Satan is casting out of the earth, down to the earth is a time of rejoicing because what is going to follow now is the kingdom, as we read in verse 10. Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God. That is at hand. That is ready to be revealed. That is the main event. It is something that God has driven his creation towards since the very beginning of creation and the time has rejoiced. So he says, hallelujah. Let us all rejoice and fall down and worship God and be thankful. You know, yeah, okay. So there's the antichrist on the earth. So what? Big deal. Jesus is going to come and he's going to consume him by the breath of his mouth anyways. You know, who is he? Nothing, nothing and nobody. That's it. He was there for a purpose. God gave 
you know, assigned this time, he wrote the story and his role is there for a few minutes and then not even a few minutes, nanoseconds and he's gone. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman who brought forth the man child. Okay. So what we learn here is that everybody looks at this event, the casting down of Satan to the earth, which is soon to be followed by the revelation of this antichrist as something that is good and glorious, that they are not worried, they're not fearful, they're not talking about the Antichrist, not even mentioned here, okay, not at all. What they are talking about is that this is the time of the kingdom of our God, that Jesus is coming, that time of his second coming, which we have all waited for so long is now finally at the door. But what happens to Satan, okay, what does he feel? You know, like we are told that, you know, he is so anxious to reveal this Antichrist that the Holy Ghost has to really, you know, restrain him, put like, a, you know, like, you know, your horses, you'd have rein them in or something like that. That's not what we're reading here, because if that was what was the reality, the story, if that's what was happening, then you know, Satan should have been the one rejoicing and everybody else should have been sorrowful, right? But it's the opposite, because we can read here. In verse 12, therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. The devil has come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he has but a short time. So the devil knows this story. He's read the book. He's very familiar with it more than you and I. And he knows that that day he is cast down to the earth is the time when he is going to have to, this antichrist is going to be revealed. And once that Antichrist is revealed, there is no turning back. 42 months or thereabouts later, he is going to be taken. He's going to be first thrown into the bottomless pit. He'll be let out of there for a short time again. And then he's going into the lake of fire. His time is over. All these centuries and millennia and you know eons that he has enjoyed being the God of this world. And, you know, spreading his evil throughout the heavens and on the earth, you know, doing Basically, everything that gives him, that drives him, his lust, his passions, he's been able to fulfill them. That time is now over. And therefore, it is a time of great sorrow for him. Therefore, the person that is most sorrowful and filled with anger at the revealing of the Antichrist is Satan. Therefore, it makes sense that the only one who loses from this revelation is Satan. And all those who are waiting for the coming of Jesus Christ, they benefit, they rejoice. So therefore, this restrainer is Satan. Now we understand this, you know, I'm going to stop this year because there's something more that we really need to go into, maybe when we get to chapter 13. That we can just quickly take a look at this year in verse 2. It says, and the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear. And his mouth is the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. So you could literally say that the dragon is the power, he is the seat, he is the great authority. So this dragon, Satan, was ruled the earth, ruled the world that sits on the earth, the world of men for so long. He has done it as an evil spirit, as a disembodied spirit for, for a long, long time now. Now, finally, he is going to be sitting in the body in physical form right here on this earth, okay? And he is going to be that God, which God, the creator, is going to give to the world. That is going to be God's gift, literally, to an evil world. You say, okay, you rejected me. You chose this God. Here he is. Now deal with him. And what is with this God, Satan? What is with him? He is filled with wrath. He is filled with rage. And when you have an animal that is cornered, what does it do? It fights to the death. So this is the time from this time onwards until like in 2 Revelation chapter 19. This is a time when Satan has now understood that he has nothing more left to lose. He is going to lash out. And he is going to be filled with rage and he is going to steal, kill and destroy like never before. So that unless he was now stopped, nothing would be left alive on this earth. And that is why in Matthew, I believe in one of the scriptures we read that, you know, 
God has to cut the day short, otherwise no flesh will be saved. And I think one of the reasons for that is, is this madness of Satan at this time, knowing that he has but a short time, he is now not going to hold himself back. And when right now he holds himself back, he's got a lot of power that he cannot exercise and he does not want to exercise because that God, you know, it is God's power. God has given him powers to use for to serve the purposes of God in the end, but he doesn't use them all because he likes the world the way it is. He loves it as a matter of fact, this is his world. He doesn't wanna destroy it. He doesn't wanna destroy all the cities and all the people that are his slaves. Oh, he loves it. But now he knows that, you know, this is it. His game is over. He is going to lash out. And then there's going to be tribulation like there was never before on this earth. And therefore, Jesus himself is going to come and cut those days short, otherwise no flesh would be saved. But literally, if people ask you, what is the identity of the Antichrist? Yeah, the Antichrist is literally Satan in the flesh. That's who he is. It tells us right plainly here, the dragon gave him his power and seen his great authority. And therefore, it is the dragon that is the power of the Antichrist. And therefore, it doesn't matter whose body he sits in. Okay. All these people that are obsessed with trying to identify who the man is, they are missing what the Bible is teaching them. It is insignificant who it is. And even if you could identify it, it doesn't make any difference because the Antichrist is not the story of the Bible. Jesus Christ is a story and we need to keep our minds stayed on him and not on all this evil, not on Satan. Satan has been created to serve a purpose of God and Satan knows that. And he also knows that his time there's uh, his clock is going to run out. His hourglass of sand is going to run out. And when he sees that sign, which is this uh, Michael coming to fight with him, then he knows his time is up. He's going to fight like a cornered rat, but he is not going to win. He is going to be cast down. And then these other events from 13 onwards, which are only going to 13 into chapter 19. This is the very tail end of the tribulation, which is going to be, you know, three and a half years or so. That's a bit. That's it very short period of time. The Antichrist appears, like I said, for a nanosecond. He's not that significant a, fig a figure in the Bible. And therefore, we need to be stopped obsessed with it. And what we need to understand is what the real teaching is, the second coming of Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him. Now I'm going to end this year. And if anybody has anything to add, please go ahead quickly. Um, I guess I'll just add something. Um, in the book of Job, when, the, when God is before the sons of gods, uh, uh, comes unto him. What's your thoughts on that? Is that in the below the firmament, in the firmament? I think you said you've spoken on that in a video or two back. That's it. Well, you know, my thought on that is this, that the sons of God, as we know, are flesh and blood. Okay. Therefore, I believe their realms are somewhere, either right here on the earth somewhere that we are not lands, which we are not aware of. Okay, because everything we are taught about geography and everything is false. And most likely that's the explanation, okay? Or they may have some, some domains in the heavenly realms, because in Revelation chapter 12, it said, Rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Okay, but that is not talking about people that dwell in the heaven, the city of God. That is because we know in the city of God, there are the souls that have been, you know, the, the souls of them who were killed, etc., that are in heaven. And in heaven, we have souls, not like bodily people. Okay, so it, it kind of makes sense to me that there are some regions or areas. And then, of course, you know, in, in Isaiah 14, we read about Lucifer. He wanted, to ascend, he wanted to go to the Mount of Congregation and sit there. So, you know, you hear a lot of these stories about like this Mount Meru, et cetera, being at the North Pole. Or uh, that is quite a likely explanation that, you know, right here on this earth itself, there is this place which is the Mount of Congregation. That is where God with, meets with these sons of God. And it is not directly in the city of heaven. Okay, and that's where Satan showed up. Okay. Actually, that's exactly what I was thinking too, that it's in the sides of the North. That yeah. is possibly where it was. That's right. Thank you. Yeah, okay. That's, that's, you know, again, like these things are not something that we will, we can say with certainty that's the way it is. We will not know that for sure until you know, the, from the fullness of knowledge has come. But, you know, we can put some pieces together. Like you said, yeah, 
in the sides of the north. And you know, they, and it also talks about the city of Zion in the sides of the north, in a beautiful situation, which of course is, uh, we also understand that, you know, all these sons of God are not evil. You know, just like all the angels didn't turn to evil. So they are definitely have some domains and I would venture to say a lot of them are right here on the earth because they are all hidden from us. Okay. And that's where they came from also in Genesis, you know, some of these evil ones also have some areas where they live and, but also the ones that are not evil. Yes, please Taylor, go ahead. Yes, Paul, uh, there's a scripture. Uh, I will have to look it up and I have it ready for you next week, but there's a scripture in the Bible that said God divided the earth. He gave his half to his inheritance, and he gave one half to the sons of God. Um, that scripture is in the Bible. I remember reading it. Like I said, I'll research it and, and have it ready for you uh, next week. Well, in Genesis, it does talk about that, you know, the earth was divided, but it doesn't, it doesn't say directly that half of it was given to the sons of God. At least I've not read it. But, yeah, it does, does talk about the earth being divided, which is that, you know, what it what it uh, in Genesis one we read that uh, you know let uh, all the dry land appear and all the waters gather together into one place. So it specifies it seems to have made a separation that there was one body of land and there was one body of water. But at some point in time after Noah's flood, you know we read about the earth being divided in the days of Peleg, and that is the meaning of the word Peleg is that it's division. So you know what yeah, these continents, et cetera, that we have today, these divisions probably did not exist in the beginning. It was just one massive land, land mass, which has now been spread up into it. And uh, you know, there's many things which are just alluded to, like you know, these uh, Tower of Babel time, they did not want to be scattered over the face of the whole earth. And uh, you know, so why, you know, that there seems like there were certain regions of earth that were not desirable let's say so those are the kind of things but uh it seems that that division the dividing of the earth into pieces it occurred at some point in time after the tower of babel all right thanks all right all right anyone else all right friends you know again like these are uh teachings uh that we go through uh, basically, you know, ultimately would be to go through the whole Bible because it is all the knowledge of God. And therefore, I pray and hope that, you know, you're all studying it and uh, that uh, these videos that we do here, this fellowship, this is only like a little, you know, like it's like Cole's notes or something. These are just study notes. But, uh, but the main text, of course, is your Bible, your King James Bible. So please spend time in it and confirm the information that is presented here or anywhere else that you might encounter it and make sure that you understand it because don't just accept it without understanding and pray for understanding. So we can pray that, you know, like uh, that uh, prayer from uh, Ephesians, which is my, one of my favorite prayers again in, uh, in chapter three, I believe. Let me just turn to that one here for a second before I go. Yeah. In verse 14, it says, so this is the prayer we're going to end this with today, okay? For this cause, I bow my knee the, knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and in earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. What a wonderful, you know, blessing, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, like that power that's working, that will be working in the Antichrist, we are told, is the power of Satan. You know, we are thankful. We give thanks on our faces before God that the power that works in us is the power of God, of the Holy Spirit, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the power of their love. 
Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly of all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen and amen and amen. All right, brothers, we'll get together tomorrow morning at the same time. God bless you all. Have a blessed day in the Lord Jesus. And uh, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not be shamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And the following is the original video from uh, 2018, I believe, that Rob watched, uh, which led him to ask the question about the identity of the restrainer in Second Thessalonians. Greetings to all viewers and listeners in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is Paul Sandhu. Today I want to do a very brief video on uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, in which there is a verse of scripture which says, now you know, 2nd chapter 2, verse 6, now you know what withholds that he might be revealed in his time in reference to the Antichrist. And verse 7, for the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now lets will let, which means who is now preventing the revelation of this Antichrist will prevent it until he be taken out of the way. So the most common teaching this I heard is that it's the Holy Spirit that is the one that is preventing this revelation. Is that the correct interpretation? No, that is not the correct interpretation. So let us now read here from the beginning of chapter 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you. This is the same words that Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 24. Let no man deceive you. Okay, for many shall come in my name, and say that I am Christ, and shall deceive many. So here the Apostle Paul is repeating that warning, saying, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And some people say, Oh, this falling away is the rapture. No, this is not the rapture. Except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things, and now you know what withholds that he might be revealed in his time. So there is some power at work to prevent the revelation of this Antichrist and for the return of the Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, Because that's what we are all waiting for. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now lets will let until he be taken out of the way. And then that wicked shall be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they might all be damned, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. All right, so let's go back up here. So this is talking about the time which is very close to the end, just prior to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we have read in the book of Revelation and other portions of Scripture in Matthew 24, that, of course, somebody called the Antichrist, who essentially is going to be Satan embodied, okay? The spirit of Satan, like, you know, when Satan entered into Judas, for example, in that very manner, this person will be literally Satan incarnate, okay? So he is going to come.
but there is somebody, there is some power that is at work here that is preventing this from happening. Who is, who or what is that power? And you know what? I'm not going to make this a long video. I'm just going to give you the answer. The person or the spirit that withholds this, the revelation of the Antichrist, it is not the Holy Spirit. It is Satan himself. Okay. The one being whose interest it is not in, okay, it is very detrimental to his interests that this Antichrist be revealed and these end time events begin. And that person is Satan because he knows when that day comes, then he has but a very short time. Satan actually is very, very happy the way the world is. You know, he sits up there above us in some heavenly realms. And from there, he controls this world, as he is called the God of this world in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. He is called the God of this world. He controls all the powers that be in this world, all the elites, the politicians, presidents, prime ministers, kings, popes, you name them. They are all his servants. They bow down to him. They worship him and they feed him. What do they feed him with? They feed him with blood, lots of it, copious amounts of it. This is why wars never cease, turmoils never cease in this world. You know, there is never any time of peace. There's always some sort of situation that is arising, some kind of war is breaking out, and, you know, Sometimes it's like smaller numbers, and sometimes there's like great numbers, as for example, in the 20th century, you know, the Second World War, in Russia, in China, combined, you know, some like quarter billion people at least died in wars alone, violent deaths, bloodshed, okay? And that was Satan's feast. So he's very happy with the way the world is. He doesn't want to see this world end. He wants things to continue the way they are. He is not the one that wants to see the Antichrist revealed and his own time come to an end. Therefore, he is the one that actively works to prevent that day from coming. But then the Bible tells us that there will come a time when he will be taken out of the way. And that word taken out of the way, it gives the impression of something that is, you know, violently removed. All right, let's turn to Revelation chapter 12, and we shall begin in verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against, fought, dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out under the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. All right, so let's uh, turn back to Second Thessalonians chapter 2, begin again in verse 6. For now we know what withholds that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity does work, does already work. Only he who now lets will let until he be taken out of the way. So this Antichrist is not going to be revealed until Satan is taken out of the way. From where? Out of the way in heaven. That's where this is that's where he has to be taken away from in order for 
the prophesied second coming. First of all, the prophesied coming of the Antichrist and to be followed by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. For example, after the Satan, after Satan, the dragon, the serpent is cast out. What do we read? And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God. When is the kingdom of our God going to come? When, of course, Jesus Christ is going to come. And in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, this is describing this time, same time as in Revelation chapter 12. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's talking about this time of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and the events that must pre precede his coming, those things that must need to happen. And one of the things that has to happen is that that man of sin, the son of perdition, must be revealed. Yet there is someone that has stopped this from happening, and that someone, of course, is Satan. It is not the Holy Spirit that's preventing the revelation of the Antichrist. The Holy Spirit will love nothing more than to see the day of Christ and for this evil world to come to an end. And it will, of course, in God's timing. So God has allowed, you know, Satan to exist up there in heaven and uh, to work his evil on the earth and in heavenly places too, it seems, because we can read in Revelation chapter 12, in uh, verse 12, Therefore rejoice ye heavens, plural, and ye that dwell in them, plural. So, you know, looks like, you know, his evil is not limited just to the earth, but it seems to be also infecting the heavenly realms above us. And in Job, we can read the heavens are not clean in his sight. And if Satan's up there, of course, they're not going to be clean in God's sight. So once Satan is cast out, once he is taken out of the way in heaven, it is then that the time of Christ will come. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down. He is taken out of the way which accused them before our God day and night. Okay. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. Why woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea? That's also an interesting uh, you know, clause in there, earth and of the sea. Hmm. Okay, so the woe that's coming is not coming just on the surface of the earth. It is also going to come upon the people that are inside the earth. Yes, inside the seas, I mean, you know, there are worlds that exist inside our earth and the sea, as I taught in my underground video, which you can go and watch. Okay, therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. See, this is the reason why Satan is doing his utmost to never see that day, but of course he will, but he would love nothing more than never to see the day of this Antichrist because he just loves the way things are right now and he loves nothing more than for them to continue like this forever. But I have some, uh, you know, well, bad news for you, Satan. Because things are not going to continue the way they are. The day God pulls the plug, you are going to be cast down. And you're going to come to this earth and to the sea. And you're going to be very mad. And you're going to then unleash the Antichrist upon the world. And this world is going to burn like it never has before in history. And then shall be fulfilled the words of Christ in Matthew 24. For then shall be tribulation upon the earth like there never has been since the world was formed, okay? So yes, so this here in Second Thessalonians chapter 2 is the one who withholds that the Antichrist might be revealed in his time is Satan. And we can read on here in verse 7, For the mystery of iniquity does work, already work only he who now lets will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose working is after the working, whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power 
and signs and lying wonders. And what do we read in chapter 13 of Revelation? And let's read here. And he exercises in verse 12, Revelation chapter 13, verse 12. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he does great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven in the sight of men and deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. So what is he doing? He is doing signs. And what do we read in uh, verse 9 of Second Thessalonians? Even him whose working is after the whose whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. I don't think I need to make this any longer, okay? When you compare Second Thessalonians chapter two to Revelation chapter twelve and thirteen, it becomes quite obvious that uh, that this one here who is doing this preventing of the revelation of the Antichrist, and of course, you know, you understand that Satan would want nothing more. He doesn't want to see the second coming. He doesn't want Jesus Christ to come back to this earth. You know, he's the God of this world, and he knows when you know when that day comes, he is going to the bottomless pit first, and then he's headed for the lake of fire. Why would he want to see that day? And he knows that, you know, the time, the day the Antichrist comes, three and a half years later, Jesus is going to appear, okay, or somewhere in that neighborhood, not too much longer after that, okay? So do you think that he, it is in his interest to see the day of the Antichrist? Who is the one that has the most to lose? It is, of course, Satan. Therefore, he who prevents this, he who lets right now, it is Satan. Until he be taken out of the way, he'll be taken out of the way when we have that war in heaven, which will happen after the judgment of the seals and the trumpets. It'll happen after the testimony of the two witnesses in Jerusalem. And then shall this war come in heaven. And from there he shall be cast out down to the earth. And then he shall just Basically, then there's nothing left to lose anymore. So he is going to unleash the Antichrist upon the world. That's he, that's who it is that is preventing the revelation of the son of perdition, of this man of sin. Okay? So don't buy this, uh, this uh, false teaching that it is the Holy Spirit that is doing this preventing. It is not. And the Holy Spirit can never be taken out of the earth. What the heck? What kind, of, what kind of teaching is that? Okay, there's going to be believers on this earth right until the very end. Okay, and we have the promise of the Holy Spirit. When we believe we are given the earnest of the Spirit, He dwells in us. Okay? So do you think uh, God is going to pull the Holy Spirit out of all His believers? You know? God fills the heavens and the earth. His Spirit is everywhere in all His creation. You know, it's impossible for it to be removed. Okay? Another one of these false doctrines that just is, uh, is taught like in the lies repeated so often that people consider it to be the truth. But this is the truth that it is Satan who is the one who withholds, who is the one that lets until he be taken out of the way. And that time of taking out of the way is when he has this war in heaven and he's cast down to the earth. Okay, so do your study compared to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 to Revelations chapter 12 and 13, and I think it will become quite obvious to you that yes, this is the only explanation that fits is that this one doing the preventing is Satan and no one else. Thanks for listening. This is Paul Sindhu. It's coming through.